Hi there folks. Today, in the interest of getting you to hone your perspective for the research paper, I'm going to deliver a paper to you. It falls directly chronologically in the course uh, material. It's a paper I wrote um, quite a long time ago, but it's about wine in the 16th century. Um, actually, wine as food and medicine in the 16th century. And I want you to um, think about this. It's a little more detailed than most of the lectures I'm going to give you. Very, very much more specific, focusing on a specific time and place and beverage. And the angle, of course, is medicine. And I want you to think about your papers and whether you are way, way too broad or, way, or are trying to write something that can't be written using primary sources. Um, are you only using secondary sources? And you'll notice throughout this paper that I'm going to draw on a lot of primary texts. Um, so it's going to be a little different than the other lectures, but I think it'll be fun and it certainly fits the, in the course material. So let's go. Okay. In the late 20th century, wine drinkers, wine drinkers suffered a barrage of conflicting messages regarding the role of wine in promoting health. On the one hand, medical research, not uninfluenced by the wine industry, proclaimed the antioxidant virtues of wine, and at the same time every bottle bore a strident warning on the dangers of alcohol consumption. In the mid-16th century, a com comparable controversy arose with equally mixed motives during a period in history when the growing population and expansion of trade encouraged the vigorous promotion of wine as a nutritious, nutritious and medicinal beverage. This was also in the midst of the Reformation, when not only was the traditional role of wine in the Christian sacrament re-examined on the basis of biblical authority, but its place in the balanced diet was re-evaluated. Some writers were critical of medical authorities and offered fresh new insights. Others attempted to restrain an apparently drunk and unruly populace by threatening them with innumerable diseases that result from drinking. Now, this controversy over wine reveals the anxieties that faced 16th century drinkers as they tried to negotiate the rival claims of health, morality, and pleasure, much as we do today. Then as now, the medical arguments were informed by deep cultural suppositions, and authors had their own particular access to grind. Some praised wine by force of habit and cultural prejudice. Others carefully crafted their arguments with the aim of curbing consumption as a means of social control. The Reformations, and I mean both Protestant and Catholic, and their insistence on public decorum and morality also had an effect on early modern attitudes toward wine. The argument for regular wine consumption was never bereft of supporters. First, according to medical authorities, and this is from the ancient times all the way into the modern period, wine was considered a necessary nutrient. As the closest physical substance to human blood, it was thought to convert easily into blood and thus would be assimilated into the body easily. In the Alimentorum Facultatibus, this is Galen, um, he settled the question in one single sentence, which reads as follows. Everyone agrees that wine is among that which nourishes. If, and if everything nourishing is food, then it must be said wine too should be classed as food. And of all the wines, the red and thick are most suited for the production of blood because they require little change before turning into it. Now this was kind of accepted as fact um, up into the early modern period. Yet physicians could not agree on how wine affects the body. According to the tenets of humoral physiology, anything which is nourishing must be hot and moist, since life itself is defined as the confluence of vital heat and radical moisture. Now, logically, wine heats and moistens the body, something that can be empirically verified. Think of a cold day when you take a drink, right? Or a cool draft that, that quenches your summer's thirst. And with equally empirical evidence, wine also dries the body um, because of its diuretic properties and in excess, of course, chills the body. You know, you, you can catch a chill very easily if you drunk, have drunk a lot. Now, on top of this, due to its volatile nature, wine was said to send cloudy vapors into the brain that kind of confuse or obfuscate your intellect. They cause stupor and in extreme cases, inebriation and of course, loss of consciousness. You pass out eventually. In the end, can wine be said to promote health or hinder it? This is the big question. Of course, it still is, right? And 
is simply that wine in moderation is good for you, but in excess is harmful? Or actually do other factors play a role? Does the color, the texture, the flavor, the age of wine, does, do any of these things make a difference? Uh, does the time of day we drink, does having it among other foods, does drinking while you eat make a difference? Or does our, our phys physical constitution or age somehow determine how we should use it? Well, there was a certain reassuring similarity um, between the words vitis, which is the genus of wine, uh, the wine grape, and vita, meaning life. And un among its unmistakable virtues, of course, it makes us happy and perhaps less obviously, people insisted that it, it uh, aided digestion, provoked urine, which cleans out the body, resolves clogs by means of its scouring uh, qualities. In other words, it sort of cleans your body out as it goes through. Wine not only serves to, uh, this, these are the words they used, uh, provoke Venus, as they politely put it, which means to increase sperm production, which of, of course, remember, is created from that plethora of blood. Um, but then it also, you could say, fosters conception, right? It's not just, uh, you know, it doesn't debilitate. As a hot and moist element, it's particularly suited to those prone to melancholy, those of a cold and dry complexion, and those Saturnine personalities such as scholars and artists as well as people who are aged who are um, you know usually cold and dry um, remember that the little phrase vinum laxenum est mean meaning uh, wine is the milk of the aged yet the question of the temper uh, temperature of wine remained somewhat naughty temperature refers remember not to the tactile uh, measure measurable heat on a we, that we would measure on a thermometer, but rather the effect that that has on the human body. In other words, how do wine's humoral qualities? Is it hot and cold? Is it dry and moist? Whatever. How do those affect our humors? And classical sources appeared to have settled the question without much difficulty. So the so what I really want to try and address is why was this question reopened in the 16th century? Um, it appears to have been the result, I think, of gaining access to a number of, ver of conflicting sources and trying to reconcile their opinions or trying to come to some definitive solution because the ancient authorities actually didn't, weren't so consistent about this. Uh, and it was fact, in fact the rigorous tools of textual analysis used by medical humanists that were, that were used to examine this question. So, Interestingly, many authors struck out with their completely own reasoning um, and their own cultural prejudices, as we'll see. Um, some people just naturally thought wine was good for you, and some um, didn't. So the first significant discussion on the temperature of wine, this is written in the 1530s uh, in Verona, which is a you know, wine-producing region. A physician named Giovanni Battista Confalioneri in t attempted to clarify the question, and his efforts were published, both in, in Venice and then in Basel in uh, 1535. And he basically recounts these various positions. He says some people have argued wine is hot and moist, some people say it's dry and cool, some insist that it depends on the type of wine and its flavor, he, and he says basically sour wines are colder and styptic, meaning they dry out, they tighten your, your uh, the pores in your body, um, and tannic wines are drier, right? You know that kind of puckering that a really tart, not tart, but tannic wine will draw the moisture out of your tongue. And um, so, so he used this term precisely as we use the term dry today. When you talk about a dry martini, that actually comes directly from humoral theory, that, that term. It's not dry, it's a liquid, obviously, right? But it dries out your tongue and that kind of refreshes you. So unlike Hippocrates and Galen, Confalioneri points out that Aristotle was very keenly aware that different wines have different faculties, um, and we should follow his lead in investigating rather than just saying, oh, here the authorities say this, settled, the question is settled. Actually, it's a lot more complicated, is what he's suggesting. And with a very rare appreciation for the concept which we now call terroir, right, the role of the earth and the climate and the soil and the human intervention, um, the role of terroir on the quality of wine, Confalinari says, really you should pay attention to the location of the vineyard. Think about the exposure to the sun, the properties of the soil. These are crucial factors that will determine not only the flavor of the wine, but ultimately whether it's good for our health or how you use it in promoting health. 
and even the water nourishing the vines will affect its quality since he says water all tastes different some tastes of I'll quote here some taste of alumina some is bitter some is sulfurous some salty some unctuous I'm not sure what that means it means fatty really uh, some taste like asphalt you know that that tastes like when when the cement gets wet it's got a very distinctive aroma so all of this determines the medicinal virtues of the various wines. The, in other words, the water is actually going to affect the, the wine's quality. Um, you could taste gravel in wine very easily, right? And he says this, there are some wines that aggravate the head or cause pain, others that either remove pain and, and actually cause sobriety. That's <laughs> weird. It's not then merely a matter of the quantity consumed, but the quality of the wine which will either leave you refreshed and invigorated or give you a nasty hangover. Uh, and he admits that it would be ideal to have physicians just investigate what properties are first common to all wines and then go to s the specific differences. But he, th but he thinks that's going to be futile in light of the fact that there are thousands of different kinds of wines and, you know, and, and, and getting a rating for them, you know, even, even Robert Parker can't manage that. So, so unlike the ancient authorities, he re refuses to make any bold and general statement about the qualities of all wines. He says they're, they're all very, very different. Nor is there a simple way that wine affects people of different constitutions. He says sometimes it can heat those that are frigid, it can dry those that have superfluous humidity, it can also cool and refresh people who are bilious or hot. And, um, so depending on the complexion of the drinker, the particular elements of, of the wine, how it's, what it's composed of, will also influence how it can be used in a healthful diet. This is really very careful consideration of, of the incredible diversity of wine and, and its effects on people, which we know are very diverse. He says a watery wine will affect a phlegmatic person very differently than a bilious person, right? Someone who's by nature hot. A hot and volatile wine will make hotter constitutions drunk quicker because the vapors, the aerial elements in the wine, will rise more easily to the brain, right? They're, they're going to steam up more quickly and go into your brain and make you drunk very quick. Whereas, um, uh, and they'll rise more easily to a brain than in colder or heavier bodies where it, it won't happen. In other words, the effects that we would today ascribe to alcohol content, metabolism, body weight, um, they're actually completely intelligible in these humoral terms that Confellianeri is talking about. Um, he would have categorized people in, in various humoral constitutions and then said, well, this, is, this makes sense why this wine is affecting this heavier person or this um, person with a slow metabolism differently than someone who's highly strung or thinner or whatever. You understand what I'm saying? So um, by this logic, passing out is also just the result of wine overcoming and suffocating the innate heat. It's sort of like pouring water on a fire. You just put it out. So, so the inherent differences among individuals ex also explain why some people like sweet wines, some like them slightly bitter, some like them tart. You know, this, this is, has to do with our humoral makeup. Our own, that will determine which kinds of wines will be effective at balancing our constitution, which ones our taste buds will respond to more favorably. And that, I have to say, physiologically, modern science has not understand, does not understand taste. We tend to think of it as a sociological construct wherein it, it does have, of course, a biological basis. We don't understand why some people like certain things biologically. Um, but he's saying also taste preferences are um, predetermined, but they're not absolute. Um, in practice, cold and dry people should enjoy hotter and moister um, sweeter wines, right? And cold and moist people will want austere tannic wines, which will dry out their super, superfluities, but it doesn't always work out that way, right? Obviously, culture, he understands, culture influences um, our preferences also. But he wants to settle the really important question here is of nourishment, okay? And keep in mind that he's a native of Verona, he has a, a vested interest in promoting wine. Right, very much like the Mondavis say, you know, have an interest in promoting wine, so they'll give money to UC Davis to do wine research. It seems innocent enough, right? Um, and Verona, I should say, still is a wine-making region. So, but he contends that because it has such an affinity to our own substance, it nourishes first, especially those with tempered constitutions, and only secondarily serves as medicine for people who are sick. 
Robust individuals should have no trouble concocting, that means digesting, it's the part that goes on in your stomach, um, wine, and therefore it should be part of our daily fare. It's, it's food. Wine is first and foremost a regular part of a balanced diet. Um, necessary almost. And apparently unsatisfied with this very simplistic promotion, Within a year, a fellow gentleman of Verona, um, this is Antonio Fumanelli, published his own book. This is the Commentarium de Vino, Vino Commentary on Wine, Facultatibus Vini, meaning the, the properties of wine, uh, published in Venice, just a bigger publishing city nearby Verona. Um, ranging across the full gamut of authoritative opinions, both ancient, Arab, and medieval, Fumanelli explains that Galen's very circular logic um, proves that wine is, is actually hot and moist. Food that nourishes and is, and is assimilated into the body, what we eat is thus familiar. Wine therefore nourishes greatly and is extremely familiar to humans. Since it is similar to the human body and the human body is hot and moist, therefore so is wine. That's a completely circular logic. Uh, it's nourishing, it's hot and moist, therefore it nourishes the body. I mean, it's just, okay, you get it. But by reading the text closely, he was able to point out that Galen's position does not seem entirely consistent because he prescribed wine for cold and moist diseases, which would mean that wine has to be hot and dry, right? So he's calling Galen on this. And in fact, many authorities did suggest that wine is hot and dry. And this is why Hippocrates, for example, recommended it for women, or one of the Hippocratic authors did, um, because women are moister and cooler and they should drink wine that is un lesser cut, le less watered down drier foods, and this, these things will balance their constitution. It tends to be cold and moist. They need hotter and dry things. Aristotle and Galen used wine for ulcers to dry and clean viscous humors. And so how can wine be both moist and dry if uh, is only solved with some simple logic chopping in this case? Wine substance is indeed liquid, thus it is moist and quenches thirst, but its effect on the body is to dry it out, thus qualitatively it is drying as we know it does um, dehydrate you, right? And the actual properties, he says, should be distinguished from the potential or accidental effects, or as Galen called them, primary qualities versus secondary qualities, the qualities inherent in the stuff and what it does to us. Um, and the contradiction, he says, is really only apparent. It's not real. Uh, another way to put it is that wine's active properties are hot and moist, so it is nourishing, but its passive proper properties, the way it alters us, um, it's hot and dry. So wine is an aliment, but it's also a medicine. You can see it can be, it can be both. Um, wine increases our substance quantitatively, but changes us qualitatively. That's just another way to put it. Um, or another way, it's extensive properties. It expands our corporeal substance, so it's nourishing. Um, should be thought of as separately from its intensive properties, the ability to alter us humorally. Can see the difference between those two things that's I just said it three different ways but these are using their language now to those who contend that wine is cold Fumanelli answers that this is only the case when water is added wine acts as a vehicle carrying the water faster through the body that's why it's refreshing uh, and it does so better than ordinary water would which would move slowly through your body some believe that wa wa wine with water added more easily inebriates since the water promotes the distribution of the, the wine, but in fact the wine that helps the water penetrate by means of its subtle penetrating force, as well as he says an occult property, occult here means an unseen force um, that in wine that causes it to course faster through the body than other substances, he contends. Even more surprisingly, Fumanelli insists that wine does moisten the body, even more so without water, because it nourishes the moist parts of our body and satisfies them in a way that water cannot, because water is not really nourishing. Interesting logic, really. Another problem surrounding wine concerns the role it plays in inducing sleep. Now, according to standard theory, drowsiness and sleep are the result of the brain going, going colder and moister and the result of all the nourishing hot and dry spirits having been dissipated in the course of your daily activity. And spirits, remember, are the rarefied distillation of blood in the final processing in the body, um, just exactly like, like spirits of alcohol or distillate of wine. Um, and, and incidentally, I should mention, you know, the, that physicians in the next century are going to explain how coffee keeps you awake with the exact same logic. They don't know about caffeine, obviously. Uh, it's hot and dry and volatile, and therefore it it uh, um, 
agitates the molecules and keeps us awake. So anyway, but the point is if wine heats the body, how does it make us drowsy? And the standard explanation follows uh, as, is as follows. It's not wine's qualities that cause sleep, but it's mechanical effect on the brain. Mental acuity depends on light and flowing spirits in the brain, and wine in the process of digestion causes cloudy vapors. Those seep up from the stomach and they cloud your brain, and they cause sleep not from any quantitative deficiency of spirits, which would, which would make you get slower and slower and slower, but actually by clouding them. So, so these spirits go up and it makes it uh, cloudy, and, um, and, that, um, and in extreme cases of drunkenness, of course, you, you go out, you pass out. So Fuminelli next explains that despite its medicinal virtues, wine is nourishing, and it's even more nourishing, he thinks, than solid foods. He says this, it is quicker and more easily concocted in the stomach, converted into blood in the liver, sent through the veins and easily into every particle of the body, digested and quickly assimilated into the members. He means the parts, your, your body. It penetrates quickly because of its heat and its subtlety, It's because it's very, very fine. Um, Later, he continues that it finally in the body, it's converted to light and abundant spirits, and that's why it lifts our spirits. That we use that word interestingly for emotion, also a very humoral origin in this. Um, it makes us joyful, right? Our emotions are linked in the psychosomatic body to um, you know things change in your body are going to affect your emotions. So, while the reader might have expected. Fuminelli to recommend wine primarily as a medicine and only in moderation. In fact, he promotes it even more than confallionary. He says it's an ideal element and it's an invaluable medicine. It's more nourishing than food. It's, it's, it's great, great stuff. So he goes a step further. Now these works at one point caught the attention of the guy who's really the greatest medical luminary of his era uh, in the same place. It's also Verona. And this is a, a, the renowned uh, Girolamo Fracastoro. Um, he jumped into the, the fray here with a book called De Vini Temperature Sententia, the, the, the opinions um, on the temperature of wine. It's dated, in fact. We know September 9th, 1534. So I'm, that means that he actually read Fuminelli before it was published. So, so he's like kind of in the same department. They're passing around papers, and, and uh, Fracastoro reads this and says, I, I have to respond to this now. Um, so Fracastoro, you may um, know his name. He's um, credited with the first theory of contagion, so he's very important in the history of medicine, uh, and also for having written a very long poem um, which gives a name to a disease which had just appeared in, in Europe at the time. Uh, his poem is called Syphilis. So he, he gave us that name. So he's, he's an important person. Anyway, Fracastoro um, begins by addressing his predecessors and wonders why there's this enormous debate over the temperature of wine. Um, and to allay confusion, he says, I'm not going to discuss watered wine. That's something different. Um, I'm not going to discuss very young wine, very old wine. These have extreme qualities that are um, not ordinary. And I'm not going to talk about or, you know, extreme medicinal properties in some bizarre wines. I'm just, he's going to say ordinary drinking wine. Let's say something about it in general. And he makes the same distinction between the actual and potential qualities that Fuminelli makes. He says, you know, this explains why water, even if it's served hot, weirdly, will cool your body, and why lettuce, though cold, can, if converted into blood, offer us heat. These are, these are seemingly paradoxes otherwise. And this served to clarify why it is that no one really argues about the primary qualities of wine. He says they are, it is in itself hot and moist. No one, no one argues about that. What they do really disagree about is how it affects our body. And Fracastoro says we need to make a further distinction here also between the potential future effects that are active and those that are passive. Uh, that is some result from natural processes of our body, like as the wine is being converted into blood. Um, but some happen to us down the road, sometimes altering us with no real participation on our part. And that's where the um, medicinal effect of wine comes in. So its qualities can actually be th something other than hot and moist. It's, it, it can have these accidental things that happen to us later down the road. So being of the first generation of medical writers that had complete access to the works of Galen, um, and a willingness to criticize him, which I think is very important. Fracastoro points out that Galen sometimes actually contradicted himself. Um, I remember they're reading this, this text 
1,500 years later, <laughs> almost, right? So, um, and, and they're getting them back, and they're realizing, once they have the whole corpus of Galen, that there's a lot of, he, she changed his mind, or he contradicts himself at some point. So, um, he said, sometimes it's an aliment and not a medicine, and yet it's in the book of medicines, which is really weird. So clearly, it's both, okay? And here, Fracastoro criticizes the opinion of another person, uh, Bartolome Gaiano, who I think took place in this controversy, but I don't think his um, book was ever published, because no, there's no record of it existing, but he, but he talks about it. So, with this formal distinction between actual and potential, active and passive properties, uh, Fracastoro can say that, of course, we all know wine is liquid and it's moist, but it still dries us accidentally, and that's its proper medicinal role. That's why it's properly used for people who have cold and moist diseases. So if you've got a cough, a cold, a catarrh, um, think of NyQuil, folks, right? Again, alcohol's in that, right? Uh, but he says it's not good for hot diseases like fevers or gout or things like that. Um, and one by one, he counters the arguments of ancient authorities arguing that wine is hot and moist and concludes in the end, these guys are all wrong. Uh, and when we speak of the qualities of a food and drink, we refer not to the fact that it's nourishing, but the effects it has on us, how it changes us, right? So whether it's a food or medicine, wine does always dry the body in all cases. And therefore, when we talk about it humorally, we have to say it's hot and dry, even though it's a liquid. You get it? Because it dries out. It does, in fact, dehydrate you, right? That's why you get a hangover. So Fracastoro doesn't offer an experiment or any concrete empirical evidence. A, a modern scientist would, of course, do that. But it, nonetheless, he says his medical experience with wine shows that it dehydrates the body, and therefore all the classical authorities who just pronounce it hot and moist are wrong. And finally, Fracastoro concedes that Fuminelli deserves credit, and he understands the, the um, topic better than his opponents. <laughs> He's a little condescending here, but he says, but he calls it a dubious victory. And I think, I think Frankenstein was actually called in to settle this whole question in the first place. But, um, and in the end, of course, his, his conclusion is very different from Fuminelli's, but it opens, it leaves this whole topic open, right? Because he said, everyone who's written about this is wrong. It's, it's hot and, and, uh, and dry. Um, so, ra so, so in the end, Fracastoro does not promote wine as the ideal element. His discussion actually kind of restricts it from a medical point of view. He's saying hot people should not drink wine. It's going to make them too hot. And dry people, it's going to dehydrate them further. You understand this? So the um, next major work to address this question, question is much larger than this little debate. It's far more extensive than the preceding three books. It was also written by someone of a very different caste. Um, this is a person, a native of Bergamo. Now, it's not too far from there. It's, it's a, a little bit into the north, um, maybe 50 miles from Verona. He's a, a few decades younger, so this is a, a new generation. This is uh, Guglielmo Grattaroli. Um, he's also very different because he's a Protestant in Italy, which is unusual. Uh, he was hunted by the Inquisition, and he eventually took a practice in Basel, which is, um, very, is way north of there, and a Protestant region, 1565. Uh, he wrote a lot of really interesting dietary works on health and what to eat while you're traveling. But anyway, he finally decides that he is going to write, uh, he knew these three authors, he'd read them, but he um, um, decided he's going to write a massive book, De Vini Natura, The Nature of Wine. So this is, this is the, 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 you know, the culminating study, in, in a sense. Um, and he, he actually compliments these other authors. He says, Fumanelli is that famous and excellent gray head of Verona, which, which I think suggests he actually knew the guy. Okay? But unlike his predecessors, um, one of Grattaroli's major concerns is that, no matter what I say about, about uh, wine, good or bad, drunkenness is the real problem here is that that's when it becomes something serious. Um, and it seems that, you know, he moved into this German-speaking city and he said he could, just could not believe the, the drunkenness in this city. Um, he says, wine, of course, makes you glad, as the psalm says, vinum exilerat cor hominis, wine joy gladdens the hearts of men. Uh, but... Uh, drinking to excess. And here he says, like vulgar Germans and many others who are accustomed to this particular vice, which makes men forgetful, overwhelms their internal and external senses, and suffocates their energy. So you can see an entirely different cultural set of values has come in here, um, arguing over the nitpicky, you know, 
bits of whether it's heating or cooling our body is more more concerned about the health effects of drunkenness so in in um and actually, Gratteroli, in many of his works, he comes off as being positively puritanical. Remember, this is, this is the next generation of uh, Reform era. And it's perhaps not surprising that uh, many of his works are translated into English. Uh, his translator rendered this passage on wine as follows. Let me, let me read it to you, because I love this, this uh, wonderful 16th century prose in English. But being immoderately drunken and ingloviously swilled, as nowadays many use to do, it is most hurtful to the special cause of many grievous diseases, and it doth too much humect and moisture the whole body. <laughs> now, apart from the lovely prose, it's a very different opinion about it. Uh, Gratteroli also complained about the custom of drinking the best wines at the end of the meal with fruit, which causes, he thought, the undigested food to be pushed into the veins prematurely, where it clogs up and, and uh, corrupts there. And uh, he thought, you know, this is the, the worst idea anyone ever had, of eat, drink fine wine with fruit at the end of a meal. But the latter 16th century, the common practice, that was the common practice of uh, wine with fruit, or even worse, with uh, ice or snow. That becomes a really interesting medical um, preoccupation, uh, what, what drinking chilled wine will do to your body. And they, th they thought, brain freeze, of course this happens, it's deadly, right? So this is not to say that Gratteroli ignored the various virtues of wine, it, it, he says it does you know, in moderation, convert into good blood, aid digestion, revive the spirits, provokes urine, expels gas, increases our natural heat, stimulates the appetite, opens obstructions, and, you know, these, these lists go on and on and on. But that's only in moderation. In excess, the wine will do exactly the opposite. So quantity is the key for him. In excess, it cools the body by suffocating the natural heat, leads to apoplexy, that's a, that's a stroke, basically. Paralysis, tremor, stupor, convulsions. Presumably he'd seen people with DTs, I guess. Vertigo, lethargy, phrenitis. It perturbs the senses, ruins the memories, makes men libidinous, and fetid drunkenness makes men into irrational beasts. Okay, so it's a cultural, it's very different culturally. He's not promoting it. Gratteroli's motive here is not to discuss the dietary virtues of wine, but to frighten people into drinking less. And his book becomes a tool of his puritanical desire to control and make them more rational. He continues that it is a drink completely inappropriate for children, and especially women. It's the first time we've heard that, folks, right? Who are naturally, women are naturally less endowed with reason, and wine will only make them prone to lasciviousness, and when they drink, they more easily commit debauchery or adultery. So don't give women wine. Despite any avowed nutritional uses, the dangers of excess wine consumption outweigh any advantages for him. Totally different kind of, you know, uh, attitude here. And perhaps addressing his new neighbors, he also gets uh, ads. I can picture this Italian guy among in Basel, where everyone's swilling beer on Oktoberfest, right? He says getting drunk on beer is much worse because it emits crass vapors that take a really long time to dispel from your brain. So you actually stay drunk longer, he believes. Um, now, he says that's not quite as bad as he knows there are people in Europe, especially Muscovites, they get drunk, people from Moscow get drunk on stuff that is, uh, or other swill stuff that's mixed with cloves, darnel, darnel is a weed, but it's reputed to be uh, hallucinogenic. Poppy seeds, belladonna, that's a poison actually, so if you take a bit of it, it'll make you trip. And, uh, and he says that people put that in wine to get drug, drunk, or we, we should say drugged quicker. So that's a very interesting hint there that something else is going on in the wine also that's causing this negative attitude. Now for those, he says, who wish to prevent drunkenness, eat either the roasted lungs of sheep, <laughs> okay, seven bitter almonds on an empty stomach, um, raw cabbage, and that was actually Aristotle's favorite, lots of raw cabbage, well, uh, celery seeds or saffron. Uh, but he says saffron is dangerous because with the latter you run the risk of succumbing to such intense hilarity that you might um, more or less laugh yourself to death, he says, <laughs> you will resolve the vital spirits and then perish. So, so, so beware of saffron wine, which is actually the Hippocrates and stuff that we've been talking about. Is, uh, is saffron and wine. So, so he knows that's been, been happening under, under the pretext of medicine. So um, 
and he says fatty meat, salted herring, or better yet, olive oil, work much better because they prevent fumes from rising to the head. Um, I actually had a friend years and years ago who, before we went out drinking, he said um, he used to drink milk and he thought that would coat his stomach and prevent him from getting drunk, or olive oil, he said, works even better. This is complete nonsense, of course, but it amazes me that that weird opinion still exists today. Um, so drunkenness, again, is conceived of vapors clouding the brain, so anything that suppresses the vapors, like oil, would be better. You know, you put oil on water and it calms it. So. Drunks appear also to have been among Grattaroli's regular customers as a physician because he said he offered, um, he tried several hangover remedies. Um, he said for severe headaches and especially after vomiting, he suggests wrapping the head in linen soaked in vinegar and rose water. And these are both humorally cold, so they're going to cool your body. And he said sleep in a quiet room. No doy. <laughs> so uh, for women, he suggested wrapping the breasts for some strange reason. That's the part you want to keep cool. Um, and sounder advice, he says, is to drink a lot of water. Now, that's actually the best advice you can find in the whole book because, in fact, it is true. The dehydration is what causes the hangover. For first and foremost, water is just going to keep your body um, you, you, humid. What's the, what's, the, what's the word? Wet. <laughs> um, now, whether he can conceive, clearly conceive of the dehydrating effects of wine here, I'm, I'm not entirely sure. Whether he's thinking the water is cooling or whatever, but, but he says that's going to make your hangover much better. Drink a lot of water. And most revealingly, he says, there are some people who uh, practice, and I'll quote here, the most pernicious and most truly alien to reason is the precept to overcome yesterday's hangover with guzzling in the mor morning. So he is against hair of the dog. He says that's only going to prolong the inevitable hangover. is just going to last longer, which is also true, incidentally. Um, in any case, what promised to be a medical discourse on the properties of wine descends into a tirade against alcohol abuse. And he even suggested ways to make the profligate drunk person hate wine. He said, give him wine in which an animal has been killed, perhaps an eel or give him wine that has had uh, peacock feces steeped in it. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> of course you taste that and you're not going to drink wine anymore. Oh my God. So to be fair, Grattaroli does devote considerable energy to different types of wine, the various effects they have on health. New wine is colder, old wine is hotter. Wine separated from the leaves. This is called defoicatum, which I love. It means, it means removed of the feces, really. Uh, it's stronger, but he says it doesn't keep as well. Vines that get a lot of sunlight on hillsides are drier in nature. Conversely, those grown in the plains are moister. Um, all these factors influence the ultimate temperature of the wine and the effect it's going to have on us. Even the color, he says, is important. Rufum, or what we might take to be claret, he says, makes the best blood. But darker wines, such as what he calls negrum, which means black, uh, are crass, bitter, and hard to suggest and generate thick blood. Palmeum is wine that's clear and aromatic, generates the clearest blood, and he says that's good for all ages and complexions. But wine, of course, must be chosen according to one's constitution. Uh, contrary to custom, some wines are actually not good for you, despite the, you know, the general um, medical opinion. Old wines in particular, he claims, wine that is quite old, that exceeds seven years, offers little nutrition, is heating in the third degree, that means really, really heating, and drying, and therefore has the force of medicine, meaning it's not a good food. You shouldn't drink really old wine unless you need it for medicine. So the rest of Grattaroli's book contains a lot of practical advice for making wine, storing it, testing it, correcting it, uh, medicinal recipes. It's not directly relevant for this, this discussion on the temperature of wine, but suffice to say, he, uh, he does address that, that as, a, as a concern, and the entire temperature of wine question really remains open. His, he doesn't solve it, okay? If anything, the failure of physicians to address this question definitively leaves room for more speculation, veering much further from standard medical authority. Let me give you an example. Um, Alessandro Petronio, one of my favorite authors, is a physician to Pope Gregory the uh, and also Ignatius Loyola. He treated very interesting guy. Um, picked up this idea, probably from Fracastoro, that wine is drying, but he further concluded that it doesn't aid concoction and your digestion in the stomach, but slows it 
every sort of wine slows concoction because it toughens the food in the stomach, renders the chyle thicker, that's the digested food in your stomach, um, and wa which water does not do. I quoted right there. And he suggests, this is really important and interesting, an experiment. He says, take a fig, put one in wine and another in water. The, the one in the former will become tough, the one in the water will become soft. It's a perfect experiment to show what's going to happen in our, in our bodies. If there's wine in your belly and you put food in, it's going to actually become tougher. Um, so he says, you're much better off drinking water with dinner. It's completely against all medical opinion up until the time. And f drinking wine without water during meals is a very bad idea. It's not going to speed digestion, as many people think. So this, again, runs contrary to all medical opinion and marks the beginning, I would say, of a very slow, gradual erosion of humoral theory, especially when people start running experiments and doing empirical observations. Um, they're going to find that the humors don't really explain a, a lot of stuff in nature. Um, and uh, an indication that these, these are all, you know, these are obscure Latin medical treaties, of course, but they're not just sterile academic exercises. They also had a very interesting effect on popular perceptions of wine and health. And I want to kind of gauge that while I'm in the middle of this sort of odd, you know, um, argument that's among academics, but I want to give you a sense that the people understood this stuff and were worrying about it, just like we worry about what goes, what nutritional theory today is passed through the media and comes to us and we say, oh, should we be drinking pomegranates? What antioxidants can I get? What should, you know, is, is this good for me or bad? Kale must be good for me. I need to, it's the same thing then, okay? So there's a, for example, Giovanni Battista Scarlino. He wrote this book called the Novo Trattato, which discusses various wines that are imported to Rome mid-century. And he sort of slips in some medical opinions there, which is really interesting. He's not a physician. He's an importer, basically. And he says, Scarlino notes that while most people prefer Greco, he says Malvagia, which is Malvasia, Malmsey, uh, is better because it comforts the brain, the chest, and the heart, and it invigorates the pulse during every sickness. So he's, he's got a bit of medical opinion there, and he's giving it to you. In a section on the utility of wine, he reveals his fil familiarity with the medical literature. He says, wine gives the face a good color. It provokes urine. El coito incita, meaning it's good for, it incites coitus, is what that literally means. But he says it's good if you want to reproduce. It's going to help you increase your sperm level and, and uh, have better, more babies easier. It sharpens the wit, chases wrath, generates blood, resolves clogs, provokes the appetite, and has a host of other virtues. But Scarlino, like Grattaroli, also gives you warnings on the dangers of excess. If you drink too much, you can have headaches, premature old age, lethargy, spasms, stupor, vertigo, when you get dizzy, right? Uh, tremors, nervous disorders. And I think for, for an author writing in Rome, in the midst of the Catholic Reformation, I think he probably suspected that he couldn't praise wine too much um, without having some qualifying pronouncements and saying something about drunkenness. It wouldn't have passed censorship, in fact, if people thought, oh, people are gonna read this book and start swilling wine in, in excess. Uh, and I think his fears do seem to have been genuine because there's a particularly a passage where he complains that some vulgar people think that drinking good strong wine is going to preserve you from death. And he says it is a perverse opinion bereft of all reason. And obviously it's a corruption of medical opinion that's been floating around since our friends Arnold of Vill Villanova and people like that, right? So also appearing mid-century is a fascinating vernacular dialogue that I think encapsulates the raging controversy. It was, it was uh, as it was perceived at the popular level. It's very deceptively titled Lumore, which means humors, but, um, but its author, Bartolomeo Teggio, was an agronomic author, and he was writing about farming mostly. And here he sets up an argument with a friend whose ranting, ranting denunciations of wine are confuted systematically. And his friend's logic, is, is really a parody, I think, of the sour medical advice with which readers were familiar at this point. Everyone's telling them to stop drinking. He says, the, the, this person in the dialogue, okay, he's, who he's making fun of, says, wine burns the blood, destroys the seed of generation, diminishes energy, suffocates the natural heat, and leads to an infinity of diseases such as dropsy, falling sickness, paralysis, gout, stupor, spasms, tremors, 
vertigo, the list just goes on. And he says, wine ruins morals and makes people contentious, lazy, dishonest, furious, and homicidal. This, this sounds like Greta Rowley, right? Um, and he says, water is a much more healthy drink. Interesting, isn't it? Because we, in fact, knew, know at the day, without water treatment plants, that's wrong. <laughs> Patently wrong. If you have clean water, maybe, but... Uh, so Tejo, meanwhile, who had been spewing out poems in praise of Bacchus, finally refutes the warnings with another medical argument. He says, just as you would not blame the sword for murder, well, I guess we've heard arguments like that about, you know, to confute gun control nowadays, but he says, you should not blame wine if someone drinks to excess. In moderation, wine is digestive, nourishing, provokes urine, stimulates the appetite, increases natural heat, opens clogs, and it looks like this whole list is taken right from some medical tract. I haven't been able to identify it. But, but at this point, the interlocutor has been reduced to curt questions while Tejo rattles off how miraculous and wonderful wine is. It's good for frail young girls as an antidote for poison. And then he describes the effects that aging has on wine, how to judge it by its aroma, and he liberally seasons his whole um, dialogue with encomiums out of classical verses. He's trying to sell the stuff, folks, okay? He's a merchant. Uh, and like the Veronese physician, Stagio was a landowner, he was a winemaker, he had vested interest in promoting wine consumption. That's the point, one of the major points I want you to see here, is his dialogue shows you that advice obviously can be skewed, depending on what the author really wants to do. Um, and the point is that readers, Italian readers, were still really confused. They were presented with lots of convic conflicting arguments. Um, and this one is really just a, um, it's a long, amusing advertisement for wine, more or less. Uh, I think the same could be said for a comparable Latin dialogue written by a physician from Sicily. This is Jacobus per Praefectus. The dialogue takes place among four men in the course of a banquet and a symposium that follows, and eventually it's dominated by the physician among them. And he offers standard warnings, how wine can lead to greater vices. And in his opinion, rulers at every level of government should always abstain from wine. And all public functionaries too, because it's going to make them reveal secrets or do stupid things. And he criticizes the idea, the idiotic idea that guzzling wine before a meal is good for health and prevents aging. <laughs> That's a, clearly a corruption of medical advice, right? And apparently some doctors were making just this claim and willingly adopted the custom. But wine does have medical virtues, but one must pay attention to the temperature of the wine. And some types are hotter, some drier, some cooler. We've heard all this before. Some are useful for health, but some are actually harmful. So for example, the wines whose taste he describes as austere, sour, are cooler. And should, those should be the ones you give to people who are bilious or perform a lot of manual labor or live in hot regions. Whereas sweet wines, on the contrary, should be given to people who are cold and humid. Um, because it's going to warm them, right? Sweetness is warm, sourness is cold. So wine does have a medical role, he says, but most people have no idea how to use it properly, okay? That's a different argument. Uh, the physician answers many other questions about wine, exploding popular conceptions. For example, why Germans are all drunks. He says it has to do with their robust bodies and colder climate. That's why they drink more. He makes a remarkable claim that drinking uncut wine is useful for pregnant women, especially if they have cravings. Give them wine that's not watered. Um, he denounces the custom of drinking chilled wine with snow or with saltpeter <laughs> that apparently harms the brain. It's, you're not putting the saltpeter in the wine, incidentally. You're putting it in a um, bucket and that lowers the temperature and then you put the wine in, in a vessel in that bucket and it makes it cool. It's the same way you make ice cream in a churn, right? So. Um, and he also disapproves of drinking wine with peaches. He says that prevents the fruit from, uh, sorry, he approves of that. He says that prevents the fruit from corrupting. He doesn't say it pushes it into the body prematurely. Uh, he explained why, why you get a headache from wine flavored with sandalwood or rose or, or other, um, or musk or other aromatics. It rises up into your brain too quickly. So in the end, Praefectus isn't giving us anything new. In fact, he's a pretty orthodox Galenist. But his dialogue is good evidence that wine is being used and abused for health purposes. That's the point I want to make. Uh, and conflicting opinions invite customers to use alcohol for any reason, any ailment they might have. You go, you justify your intake of alcohol. Um, and his opinion in the end is wine that's useful, but people have to know how to use it properly. Now, it is ironic 
that among all of these books, the largest, the most well-known of all 16th century books devoted to wine. This is Andrea Bacci's De Natura Vinorum Historia, the history, the natural history of wine. It's printed in Rome in 1596, devotes many chapters to the question of wine as nourishment and medicine and the temperature of wine, which is our topic. Uh, but in a sense, he really quells any productive discussion on the topic. He'd apparently read about this whole controversy in Verona that was raging while he was a young boy, actually. He read it in Fr Fracastoro, and actually he dismisses the whole thing in a paragraph. He says, this is, this is not useful information. We need to know. He goes back to Galen. Oddly enough, um, here and elsewhere, he says, wine can be hot and moist, hot and dry, cold and dry. It depends on the color, the odor, the age, the flavor, the latitude of cultivation. There are all sorts of factors, but wine can be anything. And in fact, he says, there are no universal properties common to all wines. Uh, the ancient authorities, above all Galen, was in fact never inconsistent about wine, as people claim. And they were, what they were in fact doing was referring to different kinds of wines. That's why they had different opinions. Um, and, and he basically says, there's no point in speculating with your own wild opinions. Trust the authority. It's really kind of weird, right? And Backey was, I would say, all right, let's, let's be unfair. <laughs> he was a hack, okay? He took opinions from all sorts of places. And he said, and his point is really not to argue with them or come up with something original. He, he just sort of um, says, if I quote a classical authority, of course that's going to be true. And there's no point in arguing about this. Um, now, on the top, now, there's very interesting information on viticulture and wine varieties. And in that case, his work is absolutely unparalleled. But in terms of the nutritional and medicinal uses of wine, the whole argument comes to a grinding halt there. There's not, not a whole lot published on this topic after him. And in fact, it's not until the late 17th century and early 18th when people start to reassess wine using new theories of chemistry, new mechanical theories of how wine works in the body um, like a machine. Uh, and that opens the question again, but, it's, but it's, it takes almost a century for it to get going again. Um, and then, <clears throat> just as wine has its detractors and supporters in the era of the scientific revolution, it also does again, just as it does in the 19th century. And of course, we all know just as it does today, right? We're still, still not settled. Is wine good for health? We don't worry really about different kinds of wine, but sometimes some people say, yeah, it's only red wine that has the antioxidants. Is it only in excess that it's really bad? But is a wine wine a glass a day or two good for health? A lot of studies say, yeah, it is. So we're still not settled. There's still people saying all alcohol is bad, that it does no good for you. <clears throat> so I want you to think about this carefully, about where the message is coming from, who's promulgating it, and why. Are they peddling their themselves as authorities? Are they selling wine indirectly, ultimately? Um, that's certainly going to influence their opinion. So think about these things and we'll discuss them in class.